Hello. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to Microbiology Twitter Journal Club, where we nerd out big about all things small. My name is Danny, and in a previous life, I dropped out of my PhD in microbiology at the University of Chicago, where I was infecting skin that I grew with MRSA. Nowadays, I'm a fact checker for pharmaceutical advertisers and the president of Biotech Without Borders, a nonprofit in New York City dedicated to enabling the public with tools of biotech. My name is Faz, and in a previous life, I got my PhD in microbiology from Imperial College of London, where, amongst other things, I was making the flesh eating bacteria glow in the dark and doing some work on vaccines and also working as a researcher in. And also later I worked as a research integrity specialist. These days I'm an editor for an academic journal and in my spare time I'm a science comedian. So every week we meet to talk about microbiology. Today it's our news week where we do an overview of papers we have seen in the news or other sources and find articles that we want to cover next week in more detail. Next week will be our deep dive week where we take the article we choose today and look at it figure by figure and learn what can and cannot tell us. So be sure to subscribe and satisfy your microbiology curios sorry to sub to satisfy your microbiological curios curiosities. You can follow along with the papers that we discuss uh, in either week in our shared Zotero library linked in the doobly doo below. And we want to hear from you, so please use the comments or tweet us using the hashtag microwtj micro twjc hashtag. So we got a whole bunch of things this week. Um, yes. And the first one to start us off is this allergic reactions to Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. <laughs> yes, so this has been in the news uh, recently. Uh, so we don't have really have much data on it, but so I've pulled out this uh, CDC uh, slideshow where yeah. they do go into a bit more detail. Um, the report is a week old, so more data can come out, but there are really not very many public available details. So yeah. Um, this is a, it's like a very high level sort of presentation here, right? Like just basically saying like, they've been watching this, they know what's happening. Um, data will continue to be <laughs> collected on this. But if you do have adverse events with the first, right? Cause both, or at least the, uh, we covered the BioNTech one. I think the Moderna one is the same way, right? It's two doses. And so they're basically just recommending, and it's like, in the documentation for these vaccines, it's already recommended, right? Yeah. That if you have adverse reactions to the first injection, then don't get the second one. Yeah. So, I mean, currently, uh, this, at the time of this publication, it, there are two cases found in the UK, six cases in the US. I think there's been maybe one or two more since then um, reported in the news media. But, uh, and this is uh, interesting to put, it, to put it in perspective that at least like 272,000 people have been given the vaccine at this point. And people. yeah, and this is a very rare outcome. So the kind that that isn't very easy to pick up with phase three because phase three they recruited about forty thousand ish people, and mm -hmm. so so that's good at pe picking up. Yeah, like, so that's only forty thousand. This is like less than a quarter. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, a seventh yeah. <laughs> of what what has been given now. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anything that affects like less than one in ten thousand people is quite difficult to pick up in phase three. And yeah. this could, and so it's been very difficult for to pick out. So now this is yeah. the time when the rarer side effects are going to start appearing. Absolutely, yeah. I guess it's more just like a FYI, right, for people who are administering the vaccine, things to look out for, and then like now that people know that it's out there, then you can take the proper steps to make sure you ameliorate it. And again, it was yeah. in the original plans of these um, these vaccines, right? Like they had yeah. said there is a potential for this. So I think um, uh, you would also put in like a science article that was like briefly related to this. Yes. And they were hypothesizing that it could be PEG or something like that. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so yeah, just like I, I think we sort of talked about this, like these vaccines, the lipid nanoparticle vaccines, this is a totally new vaccine platform, <laughs> mm. <laughs> right? Um, I guess like Moderna has been working on it for a long time, so they have at least some um, instances where they were using it uh, mm. for other uh, viral pathogens, but uh, it, by and large, like it's sort of a new chemical formulation. And so I guess people didn't, this is something I guess people don't really, uh, or, or like, yeah, people knew before but like uh weren't sure if it would appear in this particular formulation with some allergic reaction to this peg molecule yeah so peg is, is found in lots of different places i mean the thing that i know it from is it appears in vapes so yeah uh, that's right yeah e liquid 
an e liquid. So oh no, Scott. I this is such a weird name for that. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's also in the various other like kind of form in various other commercial products like shampoo and. And it's generally recognized as safe, but in recent years, people have been become more attuned to that. Some, like, forms of PEG can cause allergic reactions. Um, so that's why this is, like, the instant, like, kind of prime suspect in this case. Because, right. But there are lots of lipids they're using that maybe haven't been used before. So, yeah. um Plenty. <laughs> yeah, Plenty so... of strange lipids in that mix. We saw that patent. <laughs> that yeah. patent document with all those crazy molecules. <laughs> yeah. So, it, so at the moment, we don't know the full story be behind that. Um, uh, and I so, guess maybe I also just want to add that, like, allergy is a strange sort of event as well, yeah. right? Like, allergy is like an ongoing disease process, like, that's being studied by scientists. And yeah. there are many mysteries in allergy that we don't totally know. So, anyways, things are complicated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, th the key thing is, like, so with lots, so I remember with, like, when I got the flu vaccine earlier this year, they basically said, okay, stay around for about half an hour just in case you get an allergic reaction. And that's kind of what they've been doing for the Pfizer vaccine. So they just tell you to like, okay, stick around. And so if you if you start showing symptoms, we can stab you with epinephrine and you'll be fine. But yes, yes. I think that's another important point maybe to say that anaphylaxis is usually a very quick uh, mm. response, right? Like that yeah. type of allergic reaction is like, your body instantly recognizes that thing as foreign, uh, you know, <laughs> for whatever yeah. reason. and. And it's characterized by that overstimulation of an infl inflammatory reaction. <laughs> yeah. And, like, we probably aren't going to learn too much about this because it occurs at a, a rate that's quite low. So we, may, we might need to wait for at least a million people to be vaccinated before enough people have this adverse reaction to yeah. for us to really know what's going on. Yeah. And, and once again, though, like... It, with all vaccines, like there's always been those like contraindications, right? If you have an allergic reaction. So yeah. really like we're just seeing like, <laughs> just because this vaccine is so popular right now, yeah. we see this attention. Really, this is like an every vaccine kind of piece of news. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we are seeing, uh, like this is going to be a massive like vaccine rollout. And so because of that, you're going to see lots more of these rare side effects pop up in the news. And it's going to be very hard for you, for, for us to make sure that we keep the numbers in perspective because it's, temptation for it to be blown out of proportion is very high mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but i mean yeah and uh yeah so let's move on to the next stuff that we got i think yeah. we have a huge block of papers about this new strain or yeah. isolate, i guess of so, covid19 circulating around the uk and the world <laughs> that's right so uh yeah well this is something that affected me so i know i complained last week about being thrown into phase uh to tier four which is an entirely new tier of, oh, of, they created a new lockdown tier for yeah. you guys. And the reason for this lockdown tier was because of this new strain of COVID that was circulating in the UK and the world. So I'm going to do something a little bit different. So we're going to be doing the next few papers in almost chronicle, chronological order of like okay. when they were released. So the first thing I'm, I'm pulling up is this um, nerve tag meeting uh, summary, which is... Uh, what happened Very the... scary sounding. <laughs> yes, it, it is. Nerve tag. New and Emerging Respiratory Virus Threats Advisory Group. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this um, th this is a government briefing. So again, it's not quite like um, the papers we're looking at. But it begins on 18th December where there was like an emergency meeting called about this new strain called VU 2020-12-01. And they identify it immediately as like having this uh, strange uh, N501Y mutation. Um and that there was a worrying growth in people of, with cases of this disease. So early indicators suggest that it transmits uh, between 65 and 75 percent more effectively compared to the original strains. So that's kind of a, a panic point. And uh, let's see whether because there are a couple because this entire adjustment is like almost designed to make you like kind of f like afraid. Afraid. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean because it's it's a it's a group right that's trying to urge the government to do something. Yeah. <laughs> So, like, there's a bit where it says, like, while previous variants have successfully emerged in periods of low prevalence with, without clear evidence of selective advantage, the emergence and subsequent dominance of this new strain in a period of relatively high prevalence suggests that there is a selective advantage over other variants. 
So. But I mean, like, the funny thing is, is like, that's the same. This is almost just like a more formal version when we saw that D614 G mutation. And like, that's what it's reading to me, at least at this point, right? Yeah. Is that like, this is just like, they've seen the genomes, they've seen this gen- genomic variant, and they see that genomic variant is becoming very, very prevalent, right? And so the question is, is it founder effect or is it right, actual? Um, yeah. Driven yeah. So that's going to be a, a bit of a difficult one because I think that we're going to have to uh, go into that a little bit more because again they they do in the we'll go into that a bit more in the block of papers we have. Uh, another yeah. thing that that again is butt puckering is when they mention antigenic escape. Uh, the location of mutations are in a receptor binding domain of the spike bro- glycoprotein that protein that range that range that raises the possibility that this variant is antigenically distinct from prior variants, which would be a bad bad thing for reinfections and for vaccines so uh but again it seems like they don't have much like they haven't, they haven't presented all the evidence yet but yeah because was... i mean if this is just the bullet point th- th- like, these yeah. are like these high level things that they're trying to use to convince the government to make some sort of action right because right because it's good better safe than sorry right but from what we know in terms of antigenic escape, there's a lot of places on the RB, right? Like we've yeah. seen that map, right? That there are certain residues that are very important. There's some that aren't. So like, how did this match up? This doesn't tell us that. Yeah, it, it doesn't tell you tell us much, oh, but this it was enough for the government to, well, this and then various other information was enough for the government to go, okay, we're inventing a new form of lockdown. Um, yeah. On the same day, they did release uh, a characterization of the genome, so preliminary genomic characterization of an emergent SARS-CoV-2 lineage in the UK defined by a novel set of spike mutations. Um, so uh, this is uh, a, a, well. So here they actually summarize what the mutations they found. Uh, so again, this one has um, so the yeah, thing. There's like a deletion. There's something in the fear near the fear and cleavage site, and then. They're saying that it's in the contact residues between ACE2 and the receptor binding domain. Yes, yeah, so the N501Y mutation is in the contact residues, which we also, I think, call the receptor binding domain. Um, mm-hmm. And also, like, um, and there's another P61H that's there as well. Um, and so they, and at this point, they, there's not much information, but there has been some characterization done of the N501Y uh, gene. So. They, there's been some mouse model experiments with it because it's because it's something that's been seen previously, and they found that it did increase infectivity in in the mouse model, um, and also the present was a 69. What se- what is this? What is the source? I I don't know. Yeah, so curious viral, this. Geological. Yeah. Dot org. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have a DOI. It's not really a public. I mean, it feels like a publication though. It has references. It has data. <laughs> yeah, this is a weird thing because this has this should be in a preprint, but it feels like this is a this is a very odd source. It almost feels like a a blog, but it is like written by yeah, the. Yeah, it's like a it's like a highly scientific blog. <laughs> yeah, but this this was published by the COVID nineteen Genomics Co- Consortium in the UK. And it's kind of yeah. odd that they didn't go to the down like a med archive or bio archive route for publishing this. Um, no, but I, I thought it was cool. it's just like yeah. the source itself. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, so there's there's a lot of stuff. They call this the B117 mutation, which is much more much less of a mouthful than the other name. So that's what I'm going to call it from now on. Sure. Um, B17. Yeah. Um, they also like to talk about the 60, the deletion in the 69 to 70 in the spike. Uh, so we've encountered this before on this uh, podcast because it was associated with the mink outbreak in Denmark. Um, so that had a, a different like RBD mutation. Um, and another and thing. I think this. I think we may have also covered this when we were talking about the D614G. Yeah. There was a paper saying that there's all these other mutations, right? That right. like assort sometimes. So it's very hard to pick out just the one thing right that's going to cause a difference right because sometimes it assorts with a bunch of things and and i guess here that's why they're calling it the b117 lineage yeah. right is a little bit more of a precise way to talk about it because it encompasses a bunch of kind of mutations they can't really parse out which one is having the the full effect maybe all three are having the effect right exactly um <clears throat> But at this point, we've collected quite a lot of genomes. So most of them are connected by the GISAID. Uh, so uh, Global uh, in- Institute or something for Surveillance of Avian Influenza Disease that has been collecting all the genomes from coronavirus outbreak. Um, 
Sorry, Foz, did you say that there was mouse data in this? Uh, not in this paper, but oh, it's okay. been done in a previous paper that was uh, published a while ago. Let me see if I can pull up that uh, that on the screen, because I've got like that. Oh, they don't number their references. That's annoying. Um... <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, if I just search for mouse in here, then maybe I'll find it. So. Uh... Oh, goo at all. I feel like we've seen that paper before. Yeah, adapting so <laughs> I feel like we might have actually covered that, uh, because that was yeah. part of our double header on, on whether... Yeah, that's Yeah, right. so we've actually covered this mutation before. But... So that so that paper, though, is more about... Um, Adaptation. Is, is, yeah, it's more about the mouse model than it was the biological things they found, right? Right, yeah. So, again, that's not necessarily applicable to humans, because, again, mice are already resistant to SARS-CoV-2. So, yeah. they're, so that adaptation... But this is one where they, they probably did something to the mouse. They, they gave it ACE2 <laughs> in uh, some way. Uh, no, I think this was the one where they adapted the SARS-CoV-2 to the, to the mouse, rather than... Oh, right, where the... So, right. Yeah, so I think we were arguing over which one of these models would be better because one was adapting the ACE2, one was adapting the SARS-CoV-2, and I I think that we said that okay, they're both good for different uh, things. Um, yes, yes, I remember that. Yeah, so I did not expect that paper to actually come up again. So I'm. Um, so, yeah, yeah, well, I mean that's one of the things, right? Like it's hard, right? Like with this news, it's like it's this really big story because someone actually took action yeah <laughs> right the government took action on it but like the scientific information that goes into it like it's it's sometimes the evidence is very minor right in some yeah. ways but but i think what's important is that like governments take even like the the hint of something dangerous seriously because like you don't there's so much unknown in this like mm. it's like really taking that approach like well just in case right we might as well do these things um yeah. Oh, and one... Yeah, okay. I, I just pulled up the goo paper. Yeah, it is. We had talked about it before, I think. It's pretty short paper, and it's mostly about the creation of the model. <laughs> yeah. Where they passage these viruses. So these are, like, viruses that got adapted to the mouse, specifically. And then... I see. Then they have... Yeah, then they use this mutant... Vi version and show that it doesn't what's going on here um a, a unique oh no it's the variant that they create yeah <laughs> as the mutation <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah right is this n501 is that yeah the... n501y so yeah right that... so <laughs> That's very strange, right? So they're really what they're, they're the, the information that they've had they have about this mutation is is it makes it better for infecting mice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that is actually <laughs> yeah. right, and so that's why whenever you hear like someone say, "Oh, it's virulent in mice," you have to take that kind of with a big pinch of salt because mm -hmm. yeah, normal SARS-CoV-2 isn't virulent in mice, so it's kind of hard to <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. That's it's information we have about the mutation. It, it tells us that it's in, involved in the binding, right? Yep. It's like in that binding region, right? Because we know that the reason why it doesn't infect mice is because it doesn't bind their ACE2 properly. Yeah. So it's like modifying its ability to bind the ACE2. I think this is also a good callback to the the ACE, the ACE2 decoys paper, yeah. right? Where we talked about if things change the binding interface, then that also means it's going to potentially bind less to... ACE2. Yeah. But it seems like the data that they're reporting here in terms of the population level is that, oh, but actually it seems like it's still infecting a lot of different people. <laughs> yeah. Right? So it's not really, uh, it's not becoming less fit. This mutation, even though one would predict maybe it would make it less fit in humans, it seems like it's still proliferating. Is that because it's assorting with other mutations? Is it because of this specific mutation? Unknown, right? But there's enough evidence, it sounds like, that, or that this evidence seems to be presented in such a way that they're encouraging uh, greater care in controlling, right, the outbreak. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, the the actual fact that this is this mutation was found in mice before, during this mouse-adapted model, is almost like, not necessarily, it's it's almost a confusing non-sequitur, so you don't really know how, to, how this will apply to humans. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. 
don't take it as a show of strength that like we should be really afraid of this mutation more just like something that we also know about this mutation that we're not yeah. really sure fits with the story yet <laughs> i mean like i remember when i was working with strep there was like a, a, a mouse adapted strep strain that was actually like missing some key proteins that would allow it to be infectious to humans so it's so with with these sorts of animal studies there's always swings and roundabouts so it's quite um right but yeah no i'm glad you caught, caught that point that's a really good good point yeah always always interesting right <laughs> yeah uh, uh what else yeah, the next the paper happened <laughs> yeah yeah so the, on the same so again 19th october the so this is basically this paper showing the map of like the, the sequence coverage for for like the whole of the uk and areas where they've been sequencing more so so wales in the southeast where coincidentally the strain appears so this is almost like more data but i think keeping in mind so that we can think about founder effects perhaps yeah absolutely but, and i think it's also just cool to see that they they really have quite a bit of sequence data yeah <laughs> well 20 percent or more i guess that's not super high but um yeah like but people, yeah there, there's a lot of sequence data coming from i mean all even, around the world. even one percent sequence data is actually quite a lot i mean comparing it to original like sars like 20 years ago or even something have oh sure yeah. absolutely yeah <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> this is actually amazing and it kind of shows how spoiled we and also like bring up the point that early on this outbreak when d614g was was emerging we didn't really see much outcry about it f until later mm -hmm. but i think the day the data was coming in quite scattered yeah that's true I, I think i think that's a really good point that this is an action taken by the uk right mm. with a single government right they're primarily looking at data from their own from your own country right? yeah. and, and like making those decisions based on that data. But with that D614G, that was so early in the outbreak. It was like, those were just academics trying to like pull together disparate data sources and make some sort of um, like <laughs> comments, right. On everything. Maybe it was also a little bit too far in the past, right. Yeah. Cause like they were working with older stuff, but here it's like, there's active surveillance going on right now. And yeah, the ability to take action. I think it's very exciting. You know, it's almost like, this is cool. This is like public health in action right now yeah. that the engine has been spun up and there have been some like rocky roads along the way. Um, yeah, we're seeing sort of like what some concerted uh, attention and effort uh, can do. Yeah. Uh, so the next paper, neutralizing antibodies drive spike mediated SARS-CoV-2 in evasion. So this is a this this was released a day after they announced this new strain. This was like oh part of the Cog UK collaboration. But this is almost like a research paper they were developing almost before this. So it's about the potential for vaccine escape. And so they look at uh, immunocompromised uh, patients. So they looked at like a group of patients who've been treated with convalescent plasma and remdesivir, and looking at the samples of like coronavirus taken from them at different parts of the infection. <laughs> so. The respiratory samples were taken from these patients regularly and they looked at the changes in the virus population structure and they found that there were the there was the emergence of a number of mutations including like delta h69 v70 which is seen in the b117 uh gotcha. so so it appeared that that um the, the that mutation helped to accelerate the growth of the virus and impair neutralization in some of their assays um mm -hmm. and also it led to this kind of theorizing that uh, people with like say a long-term infection are more likely to develop this mutation kind of trying to figure out how this mutation would occur would it be between people but the idea would be that in only in the long-term infection would the coronavirus have time to adapt to human physiology sure. mm -hmm. interesting yeah I, I mean it's kind of cool to see I, I think what's interesting about this paper might be that idea that oh here are real patient samples right where you can see the emergence of a, a viral population yeah so I guess it's like almost like passaging it in humans. So in the same yeah. way the mouse, we saw like certain mutations evolve when you passage it. The longer you've got a COVID infection, the longer these more likely these mutations are to evolve. Yeah, and we've seen it too. There was a case study in immunocompromised patient with very long term infection. Right. Yeah, <clears throat> I think we did like mention that. Uh, yeah. In, in yep. Yeah, in a previous news one, it was just like a short one figure thing. 
Yep. Uh, yeah, it's cool that they because what I like about this one is that it's with convalescent serum. Yes. Right. So convalescent serum being like the serum you would get if you had been infected, if you'd been vaccinated. Right. Hmm. There's also if you've been vaccinated, they actually might be different. Right. I think that that would probably be one of the criticisms you could levy against the paper. Right. Is that like convalescent serum is not the same as vaccinated serum. Yeah. Um, because yeah, because vaccinated serum is going to drive to different antigens potentially yeah and converse serum you're already like you, so people have already had like a severe covid infection so you're almost like already throwing in a, a losing uh strain a losing like antibody response uh, <laughs> oh yeah because it wasn't able to prevent yeah but it was able to clear right it has a different yeah. function almost right it can clear the virus but maybe it can't prevent the virus from you know who knows? Yeah. Who knows? because like the most best the people with the best immune responses won't show up on uh <laughs> long enough to donate convalescent serum um uh okay interesting so the next I one is actually yeah potential article to read uh yeah next one is another government uh, article so threat assessment so this um so yeah again looking to cause like some fear uh they've got like a, a couple of like diagrams on like the emergence of this new strain so i'm gonna so I think figure four, they've got like kind of the the phylogeny, and they p pass out like they pull out like like where, how diverse a strain has become. So it's like in the have UK. They, wait, have they been have they actually been calling it a strain? They they've call been, it a variant here. Ah, uh, they they have been calling it a strain. They've been calling it a variant. So uh, yeah, but I just because yeah. like I know that I, I know that that's the right this week in virologies, <laughs> um, like nomenclature gripe where like strain usually refers to something where there's a uh, distinct and proven biological impact <laughs> right. right to the difference versus yeah. things where you just know the sequence we're still trying to establish whether or not there is a significant biological um, effect yeah i think it's probably best to call it a variant but in that case yeah. because i don't think anything hit anything that we're going to present it hasn't been necessarily proven 100 percent. right uh, right Right. These are just like the the signs, right? That that should inspire caution, and yeah. the government has taken caution in this case, right? So like that's yeah. But uh, just to remember that it's not <laughs> totally known that this is some uh, terrible new viral version. <laughs> yeah, and so it, it also put, picks out that like some cases have now traveled to the Netherlands and to Australia as well. Um, and and uh, and they, it refers to a couple of tests with neutralization assays using like antibodies against it, and they point out that actually with the vaccines, they also since they elicit a T cell immunity, that's going to operate quite differently from antibody immunity. So actually, neutralization sure. tests don't necessarily indicate that that you're going to be vulnerable to infection, especially now with these new type of vaccines that specifically are there to elicit a T cell infection. So so it's not well. So, <laughs> I feel like they're trying to allay fears with more unknowns because, yes. <laughs> because, like, because I'm like, well, but how much is known about the T cell immunity that's being triggered by these vaccines? When we've looked at early vaccine studies, they've shown us neutralizing titers, not cell flow cytometry, right, for different T cell variants yeah. that have reactivity. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyways, I just want to say that. <laughs> no, like, I think we've never we've never talked about te tetramer, right? Like COVID nineteen tetramers or something like that. Like nothing about like uh, picking out cells that recognize um, antigens expressed on right, like MH receptors or anything like that. Yeah. yeah. MHC. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I think we've had a few T cell studies come out of Pfizer and where they've been following up on on things like. Um, yeah. Uh, but that's been like a more recent thing where people have asked, well, what about the T cells now? And I think that's going to become more common in the future. Absolutely. I, I think also to understand, because remember, like the vaccine we know works on the basis of clinical efficacy, but we don't really have the mechanistic information to back right. that up. So like that's going to like, <laughs> as we get the better idea of the mechanistic information, then yeah, I'm sure we'll have a better idea of what the real risk and threat is of some of these things. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, I like. I actually really like this document, though. I feel like it's laid out really nicely. Yeah, this threat assessment brief. Like, I, I like the headings. It's like directing me to like useful information, and then it really has like a nice plan at the end, right? Because like that's it's all about the plan, right? Like, yeah. Here are the threats, and then what's the public health plan that you're going to deploy to help ameliorate those threats? I like this document. For people who are curious, I would say maybe read this one, right? Yeah. And like, 
get a good summary of what's going on. Yeah, all these documents are going to be in the are in the doobly doo, so you can scroll down and you should be able to find this document. I think this is a great starting point if you want to read about this outbreak. And then you can read the other ones if you want to become unnecessarily frightened. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and other background information, right? Like, there's all sorts of things you want to get yeah. through the other ones. I guess the writers right of this one, uh, this document, do want to keep it, like everything balanced, whereas. Like, say, if you're a scientist and you want to get more citations, maybe it's okay to press the fit button a little bit, but I don't know. That's true. I do think that that happens. <laughs> I, I know that that happens with some people in diseases that are less uh, virulent. So they go like, oh, it's in rare cases, it causes terrifying disease. Like, okay, fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, okay, so recurrent emergence and transmission of a SARS-CoV-2 spike deletion deletion H six Delta H sixty nine V seventy. So again, this is from the same group. Uh, this was published uh, on December twenty first. Um, so this looks at the G GISA ID data um, and checks for how frequently cl clusters of HB uh, sorry H sixty nine slash V seventy deletion occur. Um, there is some structural modeling modeling in this paper to look at what effect this deletion may have on the spike protein structure. And they they kind of note that it, it's a, rec a thing that re recurs. So it, it's occurred a number of times. Uh, so what occurred in the mink outbreak it occurred in this latest B117 outbreak. And and they conclude that it enhances viral infectivity. And and they basically say that since it's re-evolved multiple times, it must be beneficial. Yeah, but again, based on... This is just sequence... Gazing, yeah. Right? Yeah. This is. Or do they? Oh, they do target cells. <laughs> they do cell culture. Yeah. So, uh, again, this isn't. This is a very short paper, so it doesn't really go into too much detail. But it's kind of again not adding to that story about the, what each yeah. of these mutations are doing. Yeah. Uh, the next... yeah, what each of these mutations are doing. Yeah, I guess because they do it on the structural model, I would like to. Yeah. They might have a really interesting hypothesis, right, based on that structural modeling as to how this might affect things. Um, but they're not in any position to show us that effect with the assay that they use at the end. No. Uh, Very cool. Yeah. I think this is what's exciting to me about hearing this chronology so far. It's kind of like when we talked about the D614G mutation, we were talking about it like in the past. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like it was like all this really good information, but like from something that like it kind of already happened <laughs> and the mutation was everywhere in the world already. Here's one where it's like, oh, it's like there's a pretty high prevalence in the UK. How high is the prevalence in other places in the world? It's kind of exciting to think that like we could be, <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, like they're maybe not exciting, but they're, you have to make decisions based on this limited information, mm. but then it kind of like we could spitball about like what could be the right like what 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 would the next experiments that we would see right like that yeah. would convince us right that that this is a, a dangerous thing or like how it would go and we already have a bit of a model for that right because we've seen in the d614g mutations a bunch of evidence and even that isn't like the best evidence to show you that it's more infective right but at least some sort of transmission model i think would really help um yeah cement yeah. the importance of these mutations <laughs> yeah um so we're going to move on to the next paper which is uh, almost related but because these two this is a second story that popped up at around the same time in south africa so another uh so another uh n501y mutation variant appeared yep. in south africa so this paper emergence and rapid spread of a new severe acute respiratory syndrome related coronavirus 2 line, uh, sars cov2 lineage with multiple spike mutations in south africa so a lot of news stories have been covering these two outbreaks as if they're the same outbreak, but they're actually quite different. Um, and I've got less information out of this because it didn't affect me directly, but... Uh, <laughs> so... right. But it's one of those other things where it's like, oh, maybe there's... This is the correlating evidence to say 501 and 501Y, right, is like somewhat important. Um, and then I guess maybe the other thing, why the news has picked it up, right? Is it just like, because everyone wonders if it's going to be over and here's like some bad news, right? That it might not be over because there could be things that, uh, get in the way. We don't know whether or not that's the case, but like, here's some like doom scroll piece yep. of information, right? <laughs> to, to indicate that it, it might not be, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, um, 
this all, they also kind of point out that South Africa also has the biggest HIV epidemic at the moment. So their their concern when monitoring this you outbreak mean was people. yeah, and when you mean to compromise people, you get prolonged viral replica replication, which can also mm -hmm. be allow for intra-host evolution. And so there's they've been keeping an eye out this for for new mutations because of this. Um, I'm sorry, but and to me that just always exciting. Uh, sorry, not exciting in a good way because it's very sad that this is the state mm. of the world. But like, I think these are the types of stories that drive home the point that like, like global health is everyone's health, right? And like, like other you know diseases that like might not affect your country may affect you in the end, right? Everyone's connected in sort of a huge biological sphere. We're, tra I mean, we're not traveling now, but like our world is predicated on moving things between all these different regions of the world. And so uh, we have to take public health, global public health really seriously. Um, and yeah, we should be thinking about those efforts, not just as like humanitarian and the goodness of our hearts kind of deal, mm. but also pragmatically because it like affects global health, right? Yeah. Yeah, and the thing about this is, uh, they they do monitor like the timeline of things. So they see, so they, so they start measuring like over a period of time and seeing like this this kind of mutation get fixed in their study population, and they they do actually monitor intermediate mut mut mutants. So they so with their their data, they're less convinced that it was due to the immunocompromised host, and maybe it was just like a ratcheting effect. Whereas with the B one one seven, it almost like seemed to have come out of well, almost come out of nowhere. So the the next paper is actually the most comprehensive one on terms of timeline of how this um, how the, this uh, strain came to be. So that's the CRISP. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, emergence and rapid. Oh no, this is not. This is so else. early empirical assessment of N five hundred one Y mutate mutant strains of SARS CoV two in the United Kingdom, October to November twenty twenty. Got it. <laughs> So yeah, this was from uh, a, a from a China, Chinese lab apparently with the, working with the WHO, and again these researchers downloaded the GISAID data, and again this is more sequence gazing, but this time looking at the emergence of of these new strains based on N501Y to look at the timing of emergence and seeing how it evolved, and they classified two main strains of N501Y. Uh, the first one emerged in Wales in early September. Wales is a country near to England. Um, <laughs> Um, for those who don't know, <laughs> for, for those who don't know, I've got an international audience. I need to to make sure, and I, I'm sure people in Wales will be very annoyed at me for justified reason because I'm English. That's just a normal thing. Uh, most of the world should be <laughs> anyway. Um, so yeah, it first emerged in Wales, and there's a second strain that emerged in late September in the UK, and they look at these two strains. So there's they call them variant one and variant two. Uh, so variant one appeared like. Uh, increased appeared in like the early times it only reached around like 0.1 percent prevalence and then the second one reached 49.7 percent prevalence in november so so one of them was very very prevalent so that's the one the second one is the one which has all the b117 mutations so you almost get this intermediate strain um yeah that just had the oh that didn't have some of the mutations yeah i think but they, it had the 501 or it had the N501Y. Yeah. So based on their data, the N501Y, it did improve things a little bit. So they did compare the transmissibility based on like how many people had done the growth of the infection for each strain. And they said that N501Y maybe gives about 10% more transmissibility on its own. But mm -hmm. then once you add in all the other mutations, it becomes, so the, the H69V70 deletion, it becomes 75% more transmissible than the original strain. So yeah, again, based on looking at sequences coming from people. <laughs> yeah, sequences, yeah. and we, and from what we've seen, like some of those, the data coverage isn't necessarily perfect on that. And mm -hmm. another thing to consider is uh, the strain that's got the deletion in it is actually quite hard to sequence because that deletion makes some of the some sequence tests less able to work. Sure, so sure. there's a lot of unknowns there. So it could be more prevalent than we e e already know. So. Um, yeah, but, it's interesting. So I think for me, oh, sorry, did you want to say something? Oh, I mean, I was going to point out that they also tried. To, I think they tried to compare the the, the fatalities uh, to see whether these strains mm. were, were more, and they didn't find anything. They didn't see see any inclination that this strain was much different from the original version strain. Mm -hmm. 
so that's very similar to when the 614G was reported, right? Yeah. <laughs> they looked at the hospitalizations and they didn't see any correlation between those two, but they did see um, more people getting it. Um, yeah, and, and sorry, all I was, uh, what I wanted to just add to this discussion was that, again, thinking back to D614G as a template, right, for like how to understand the, the type of data that's coming out here is that we had read a paper, there was a paper published after we read all the preprints with mm. the animal models and stuff. Then there was a paper published with new computational data to say that it wasn't more transmissible. Mm. Right, but here we're starting from, and 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 that's the same the story back then too. They started from it's more transmissible, mm. <laughs> right? Uh, just looking at sequence gazing. Then they moved into animal models, right? And then later, even more people looked at the sequence and said that it wasn't. So I'd actually be really interested to. I almost think that there's probably debate inside of those people who do sequence gazing, mm. right? Like as a as their primary mode of analysis i'd like to see like the conflicting <laughs> the conflicting information there because to me that knowing that that other mutation had conflicting information on it makes me seem like well i want to know it for this one as well because then maybe i can come to a better understanding because we're, we're yeah. kind of operating right now in the absence of any um good biological data <clears throat> yeah i think that the, this is all very early on so this is almost like like less than we we've this has been out for less than a week and some of these papers have been out for less than a few days. Um, the thing thing I'd say with this one that makes it slightly different from D six one four G is that when that emerged there was a lot less coronavirus around, so yeah. the actual competition uh, is is a lot harder to pass out the comp competitive effects. Whereas with uh, this strain that you can sort of see uh, it competing in real time with the sure. original five hundred one. So I think that that might give a much more stronger backing to it. So they've got a diagram on yep. uh, figure 2A, which shows like, it shows like the decrease of the original strain and the emergence of the new strain and how they almost like level peg at certain points. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess that data probably wasn't, wouldn't be available back then. But again, one of those things like if we choose one of these one of these papers, right, from the initial mutation, it'd be good to compare them against the type of data that was being reported at the beginning and the end of the D614G coverage as well. Right, because maybe people have learned their lessons since the D614G coverage, and maybe... Yeah, yeah, maybe they have, and, like, this is these... Now the analyses are being done in, like, you know, the most up-to-date methodology and so forth. Um, yeah. But but I also think the point that you made is, is, is spot on, where that there's so much more virus now, right? So many more infective events that that lends a lot of credence to big data approaches. Um, once again, like kind of wonderfully for the scientific minded of us that want to learn about things, sort of like so too bad in the terms of like the global health thing. Yeah. Just stop getting infected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stop getting infected. God, what's wrong with you? Uh <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the thing that, I mean, because this peak was spotted around, like, November, and so it took, like, maybe about, like, 20 days for it to actually filter out and change, so maybe there was some time yeah. of people, like, arguing about whether this is something we should raise an alarm about, because there is always, because the UK, we're very concerned about false alarms, so, mm. yeah. Well, again, as I said, uh, I think when... Going back to the one where you just saw like the the amount of surveillance across the UK, right? In terms of genomes, to me, like the story that I'm hearing is like really it's like I, I think a very responsive government, right? To to seeing a possible threat, right? Yeah. <laughs> Not knowing if it's a, if it's a full threat, but it's possible, right? And trying to take action in order to curb it. Plus, it dovetails nicely because we should be being really careful, anyways, right? Even if there wasn't this threat, right? Like it's nice to have some more justification to 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 be more careful um, yeah. but you know once again there's so many things that intersect that that's just from like my naive biological perspective of i've liked the pandemic to go away but like of course like there's all this other stuff like how yeah. does it impact businesses how is it impacting oh. right like local economy yeah, yeah this is impacting uh, i mean as a lot as a kind of this is going to be the last paper we talk about this specifically but yeah it has had a really negative effect on the uk economy and there's going to be a lot of like discussions in later years of whether this was actually the whether announcing this was the right thing to do or not. But I think that at this point, with this limited information, we're doing the best we can. So, right. yeah. Um, 
Okay, but, yeah. so that brings us to the end of uh, this big mutation thing. I think it, you know, it's definitely something that captures people's imagination, right? Like talking about these mutations because yeah, it, it sort of dovetails with a, a narrative of doom if you want to go down the road of beware, right? And um, and it's one of these cases where big decisions are being made with very little data. And, and this is like, this is the reality, I think, for people mm. to also absorb, right? About policymaking and science and how that intersects with science right it's sort of impossible to have like the best scientific and like like there's always going to be blind spots in science right and limitations to the data and so like you just there are many other reasons to make decisions not just like pure scientific reasons (laughs) yeah so it is very difficult because you have to everybody is having to make information sorry we all have to make decisions based on incomplete information these days yeah and yeah. this has been especially prevalent throughout the earliest parts of this coronavirus outbreak. Some people, we end up choosing going down different routes, and we don't know whether they'll be the right one or not. And that, mm-hmm. and the key is to try <laughs> to just have to rely on like that, right? The sort of like the 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 good thing that happens when you get a lot of smart people together and try to make common decisions, like aligned to principles. Like you just hope that is happening in the highest levels of our decision making practices, right? And, right? and hope for the best. Yeah, so this is a story that we will be following uh, as it goes because it's something that, that I'm particularly very interested in because, again, yeah, this is, I'm in the UK. We're being directly affected by it. So, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Totally. So, yeah. I'm... And I love it that it dovetails with the fact that we've read all of this D614G stuff already. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a story even, right? Like And, and like uh, sort of some knowledge of the methods that will be used to get more information about these things. Yeah. So, I mean, we just... I mean, we're really enthusiastic of this of this genre. So, I mean, obviously, we there are experts out there who you can go to to look at. I mean, the GISA ID like Twitter account is quite uh, good because they've come out with information before things are published. So, nice. um, but yeah, um, I think we're gonna move on to our regular papers, and we okay. and so now we're gonna talk about a human a human coronavirus evolves antigenically to escape antibody immunity. So, yeah. So, very... enough. <laughs> I guess this is almost in the same line. I guess they're focusing yeah. more here on um, something that is going to uh, escape the vaccine. What vaccine they use, I cannot tell. Oh, this is 229E coronavirus. So this is a different coronavirus to ah, SARS-CoV-2. This is not SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. They're trying to look at... Uh, other coronaviruses to inform what we know about our corona, our, our favorite coronavirus of the moment. <clears throat> yeah, th- I think this is interesting too because right now a lot of the times I've heard right, like I know that coronaviruses don't evolve as much as other things, mm-hmm. right? Uh, for example, the flu, right, or yeah. or uh, reverse transcription RNA viruses. But yeah, I guess I don't really know how much it actually evolves, and it's nice to have. A different model to to uh, investigate that 229E. <clears throat> yes, in this paper they take old serum collected from the 1980s and 1990s and see whether it neutralizes modern version of the 229E coronavirus and compare that with coronaviruses from that species that were isolated at the same time. Yeah, and they... they're really thinking on the the much longer scale, right? This is some some long term thinking, right, for something that might come up later on. <laughs> Yeah, and they found that, that, that over time mutations have acu- accumulated in the receptor binding domain of the 229E virus, and that the modern ver- versions of the virus can't be neutralized by the old, like, antiserum responses. So this builds up the idea that immune escape can happen in coronaviruses, but in this case it's taken a long time. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. I wonder if this would be like... Um... This is almost like a story, again, like just spitballing, (laughs) speculating uh, based on that information. This is like one of the stories that may go into saying like, oh, maybe there will be a seasonal coronavirus, but it's going to be like on on a much longer scale, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's to match their mutation rates. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So like there'll be like a really long term (laughs) cycle of of coronavirus infection. Yes. Uh, So that's an interesting... Uh, next one is genomic diversity of SARS-CoV-2 can be accelerated by a mutation in the NSP14 gene. So just picking up on your point previously that coronaviruses don't mutate very often, but that's actually very weird for RNA viruses because RNA viruses generally mutate quite, but 
apparently like NSP14 is uh, a proofreading exonuclease that ah it's yeah. proofreading ability so it's one of the enzymes that stops me, the coronavirus from mutating too much and keeping its genome stable. So uh, one of the interesting things is trying to... L so they look into some of the... They do some different bits of work, but they also look into the GISAID data, which we've been talking about quite a lot of this episode. Uh, they, they look into that to see if this gene is conserved or if they, there are mutations in it. And they find that mutations aren't very stable in the population. That the, They do occur, but they're quite rare and... So it kind of indicates yeah. that the coronaviruses do That's need... in line with proofreading. Right? Yeah. That's in line with proofreading ability. Because I think like one of the things that... One of the theories that was speculated for the B117 was that the, the something, there's a mutation in a proofreading gene that caused all these mutations to accumulate much more rapidly. But... Hmm. And that's kind of interesting. I wonder if they have... Right, if they would comment on that based on this preprint. So... Uh... <laughs> you could look at that... One seven does it have this mutation in so NSP? The, the B117, they, they say that their mutation is in ORF8, and this one mm -hmm. experiences a muta is in ORF1AB, so they're two different parts of the genome, but there might be more than one gene that is inf that that impacts proofreading. Yeah, that's true. That could be as well. I mean, okay, yeah, one, one is the, the place where the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is being made. Eight is, I think, an accessory. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's really interesting. I want to know how they, because it says they're they reporting a mutation, right? So I'm just scrolling through the figures and be like, well, when did they did they make the isogenic mutant and do tests? <laughs> so from what I can tell, they looked at they firstly did a, a survey of like 62 representative coronaviruses, uh, and then they looked at like the immune about the uh, uh, amino acid sites and looking at which ones are evolutionarily conserved across all coronaviruses and then yeah. looking and then doing some uh yeah looking some at genome so they're in, fusion rates it's kind of like they're inferring right yeah the, the proofreading uh they're inferring the proofreading function by looking at um yeah by looking at correlating the mutations in that putative proofreading gene to overall mutations in the genomes yeah so yeah. It, it's interesting so again this is unpublished data so we we don't necessarily know it hasn't been through peer review yet so yeah I, I guess what i'm saying is they don't again this is like sequence games. yeah <laughs> this is sequencing information <laughs> they don't actually have show me the mutation in nsp14 right that increases mutation rates not just the retrospective yeah. analysis Interesting. That's really cool, though. I, it's nice to... I mean, it's interesting to know that this... I mean, I expected that they'd be proofreading, right? Like, right. this is one of those things, like, you'd expect there to be proofreading ability, and then, okay, it's in this gene, they can give us some candidates, so someone with experimental chops could follow up, or maybe it's already out there and we just have to do a dive on NSP14. Yeah. Right, maybe... Yeah. <clears throat> okay, So, cool. yeah, cool. If you didn't like sequence gazing before, we've got more sequence gazing for you. <laughs> yeah. Biologenetics... <laughs> Biologen Super Tree reels detailed evolution of SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> yeah, I picked up this one mostly for the methods, yeah. um, because there's so many trees out there, and there, you know, actually, the way that you make trees is really important uh, for the conclusions that you draw from them. And in this paper, they're reporting this different technique, I guess maybe not as commonly used, uh, technique for making trees. And when they made their tree in this way, they think that it says something about um, the evolution of SARS-CoV-2, right? That kind of differs from our, our, our original story. Yeah, and this is quite interesting, because again, it's a methods paper, which already makes it kind of very interesting, because because uh, again, we, we're quite interested, because I'm very interested in how science is done. And this yes. is... Uh, this again goes into a lot of like very much mathy kind of the math of of, of biology. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The way that those trees are made, how the way that you make the tree changes, right? The tree that comes out, and then how that would change your conclusion on things. And I think it's interesting from this perspective too, because um, you know, big animals. Right, like viruses are the smallest, right? Like sort of autonomous pieces of DNA out there. Some of the smallest pieces of autonomous mm. DNA, but like animals are huge. And I think that this technique was probably used in those areas first, right? Because like you know, looking at big genomes, there's a lot 
people are just they have so much more data maybe and uh, they also have um, very easy ways to correlate differences right there's that whole taxonomy thing that people used yeah. to do I guess that they still do right where you can just say like oh it has wings of this size wings of this many number and like um, you can really quickly look at a tree and correlate phylogeny against taxonomy in the big animals much quicker than you can do it with the microbial world. <laughs> yeah, microbial, we have lateral gene transfer, which messes everything up. So it's that just... Too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have small genomes, you have difficult phenotypes that aren't as readily um, observable, and yeah, you have swapping genes, <laughs> uh, maybe even mediated through viruses. So it's interesting to see like a technique from... Um, uh, maybe vertebrate biology being applied into uh, viral biology. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, it's definitely going to be, if we do it, it's going to be <laughs> uh, a, a, a big learning curve because <laughs> it's uh, very, very, very much like the computational techniques of this. But I mean, we're seeing these trees everywhere, right? Mm. It might be good to get a, a basis of understanding on how they work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is, uh, looks like it could be on hard mode for us, but I. <laughs> 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 all right let's see what else we got next uh, olfactory transmucosal sars cov2 invasion as a port of central nervous system entry in individuals with covid19 mm -hmm. uh this one i chose to, i think this is a nice follow-up right to when we were talking about neuropillin and we were saying like okay they they gave us an intriguing beginning of the story but like how can they take us further right can they show us how that's actually happening in a in a cell in in uh, well, cell culture maybe, but actually I was thinking more like an animal model, I think, is what we were not satisfied with, or maybe a better link to the human data. Um, um, well, here's another entry. I don't yeah. think it's going to answer all of our questions, but uh, definitely it's extending that story. Yeah, it looks at autopsies from he it's in human patients, so you do get a lot more human sides. You get lots of interesting images of of cells being infected with SARS-CoV-2, and yeah. yeah, it's quite... Uh, yeah, a lot of histochemistry, right, to, yeah. to track down where it's happening, more than just, like, the couple that they showed at the end of um, the neuropillin ones in the supplementary figures, right? This is, right. like, now we're like front and center here. Uh, this is the purpose of this paper, right, to look at human tissues. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, let's see what... So next one is... Uh, let's see if I can find it. Hold up. Uh... Okay. Uh, hold uh, so it's diverse functional uh, autoantibodies uh, mm -hmm. in patients with COVID-19. So let me pull this up uh, quickly because I didn't... Yeah, uh, this, is an, this is an interesting one. I mean, I don't think we've talked about autoantibodies as they happen in COVID-19. Like, this would be responsible for, like, immune-mediated sequelae after infection, right? Yeah. Where you make bodies against your own um anti your own uh proteins and i think we did touch on this very briefly we never we didn't cover the paper but in the news we heard about the super antigenic character of um something oh yeah sars cov 2 <laughs> so i remember that because it was something that yeah. that clickbaited me into it because well i'm very right. interested in super antigens but it, it basically <laughs> uh didn't it didn't seem to present very good data on the super antigenic capability of it but right. Th this antibody was something that could happen, right? If there yeah. was super antigen character. <clears throat> yeah. So from the B cell paper that we did a while back, where we looked at kind of the the kind of immune response it causes, there was that mm -hmm. indication that it can cause lots of a non-specific immune response to happen, and this kind of follows on from that. And I felt like we haven't really talked about long COVID very often on the on our show. Yeah, and, we have not. And I felt that this was some almost like in playing into that story of what is what might sure. be one of the causes it, of long COVID. It could be like a mechanistic underpinnings, right, for all of those, I mean, I guess, like, slowly being characterized symptom repertoire for people yeah. who are long-term. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, long, long COVID is not something that we've touched on very much because, again, it's very, like, immuno immunology-focused and neurology, so it's not really in our kind of wheelhouse, but it's, this is might be, I thought this might be our gateway into looking into that kind of question. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, again, it's a very mysterious infection because I think feel it almost touches on to um, what is it, um, myasthenia gravis or no, uh, ME, uh, which is um, kind of myoencephalopathy, which is another disease that's very mysterious that has a lot of that that is very. 
Myoencephalopathy? I Myo? think so. My, okay. uh, let me let me double check this because I don't because I don't want to get get it wrong for because <laughs> I know because pe- I know there are people I know in the audience who might myalgic encephalomyelitis. I think it is. I so see. Uh, chronic <laughs> fatigue syndrome. So so I do know people who've had this, and it's it's uh, one of those. I see. These, that's that's what this paper is going to be speaking to potentially. That's what I was uh, kind of hoping to to get an uh, idea of. But okay, it, cool. yeah. Okay, what else do we got? I think we're mm-hmm. almost at the end of our list. Yep, vaccines. So, cold adapted, live attenuated SARS-CoV-2 vaccine completely protects human ACE2 transgenic mice from SARS-CoV-2 infection. Ah, that's cool. Yeah, this is another meth- um, another vaccine type that we haven't spoken about, we haven't heard about, and I guess now they have one. <laughs> uh, yeah. Cold adapted. So, like, that's it, basically it gives you an infection, <laughs> right? It, it should give you a full infection. Um, well, full. It'll give you a, 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 a biologically active infection, um, but because it's cold adapted, it's not going to travel deep into your body. Um, and... There's a flu vaccine, I believe, that's cold adapted. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, this sounds like a really cool tech, and just like a very oh, it's even coming from influenza research institutes. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, from from the people who bring us cold adapted influenza comes a potential cold adapted SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Yeah. So they they decided to passage this virus in uh, at different lower temperatures. They ratcheted the temperature down with each passage. They passaged it in Vero cells, so. Mm. Oh uh, man! So they're gonna pick up those weird mutations, right? We learned about mutations yeah. that get picked up in Vero cells. So their furin cleavage sites should be should disappear after this, essentially, mm-hmm. because that's something that that happens in Vero cells. Um, mm-hmm. uh, they don't, the authors don't mention whether there are mutations in the furin cleavage site. Uh, there were a number of mutations they spotted in this strain, um, right. and they tested out in H ACE uh, in in ACE transgenic mice. So, um, so it's an interesting one because we haven't seen cold adapted. Bef- well, we haven't seen attenuated. It's something that we've talked about. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, interesting. Okay. The and, next one. Um, the oh, no four eight hundred. Yeah, safety and immun- immunogenicity of the no four eight hundred uh, vaccine against SARS CoV two. A preliminary report of an open label phase one clinical trial. Because it is going to be impossible to blind people against this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, yeah, that's open. This is, so, for people who don't know, this is the vaccine that kind of electrocutes you when, the, when you get your shot. It gives certainly you... electrocutes you. Yeah. It, uh, it's a special so... <laughs> medical device, right, that's being prepared for this purpose. Yeah, the Selectra, <laughs> which uh, pumps in uh, DNA that is then electroporated into the cells of a person. And, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, the, this is... I mean, I do kind of tend to... I've been very negative about this vaccine in the past. Uh-huh. And I'm probably going to continue being negative about this because uh, they, 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 it's a DNA dose and they give people uh, one milligram or, or two milligrams of DNA. Now, that's a lot of DNA in a dose. A lot of DNA. Yeah, there's a lot um, of DNA. But I mean, but, DNA that floats around... Yeah, I, there could be like an adverse event from getting that DNA, but it's going to get degraded mostly in the bloodstream. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, That's but, probably why they give you so much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but even looking at, at least there are like few side effects at this early stage. Um, so that's a good thing about it. So I finally yeah. found a good thing to say about this. Yeah, I was gonna. Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. Like because the delivery method is electricity, right? Once you yeah. like, once you get over that idea of getting. Sh- I mean, people give themselves the what the Doctor Ho muscle shocks or whatever for yeah. abs. Right, like people are giving themselves low doses of electricity all the time. <laughs> um, I don't think that that's too dangerous, and yeah, yeah, we're sort of removing all of those strange compounds that come with. This could be something you give to people who have allergies. Right? Yeah, <laughs> right, or a sensitive or a mountain immune response to the adenovirus. Right, so those are two things that might stop you from having an effective vaccine. Um, of the current ones that we're seeing in the lead, uh, but this one's pretty far behind in phase one still. <laughs> yeah. But it's something I'd like to check back on just to see, like, whether it's, it's going to make it or not. I kind Absolutely. Of, yeah, <laughs> I, I feel bad about being mean about it, so I'm kind of, like, rooting for it weirdly now. 
Yeah, I, I think the more methodologies, the better, right? Like, yeah, I, <laughs> we don't I'm, know what strange directions the pandemic will take us in, and having more tools um, is certainly a, a good thing. Yeah, and the last one for the vaccine is a single dose live attenuated uh, YF1717D uh, vectored SARS CoV 2 vaccine candidate. Yeah, another really strange vaccine, right? This vaccine is the vector is. Um, yellow fever i think yeah yeah <laughs> so i i guess i didn't realize that um the causative agent of yellow fever can also be used as a delivery device um or yeah a transfection device essentially uh delivering um spike protein I so think yeah what doing. keeping in with the theme from last of like of vaccines that sound worse than they are like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i mean i think uh, presumably this platform isn't um, totally new, but it might be. It, di it didn't sound like... Oh, no, it is. A discovery of a new live virus vector. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, so this is a new vector that they're they're reporting. Yeah. Um, yeah, interesting. It would be just... I, I, have no, I have no clue about this vector. I've never heard of it before. Um, and so, yeah, it's just interesting to think about and maybe read. Yeah. Okay, I mean... we gotta we got to choose something from this list. Um sounded like you were going for the B cells. You wanted to do the autoantibodies. Uh, yeah, that's one option. I was also thinking that, like, last week we we had um, a couple of, like, really good papers. Uh, so last time we did this, there was, like, a couple of really good papers we put on. So the so uh, there's real-time... Oh, the CRISPR-Cas mobile phone microscopy one? Oh, yes. One? Yeah, the CRISPR-Cas mobile phone microscopy one. That's, like, the top of my list, actually. Yeah. Uh, the Doodler <laughs> paper. Um, uh, confirmational dynamics that was what you were just about to say <laughs> yeah confirmational dynamics was another one i was about to say which is just the real time like how the spike actually fuses together the so, fret fret yeah. on actual particles <clears throat> yeah because those are just two, two very strong candidates but yeah um, I, i'm definitely into i, I want to talk about crispr <laughs> yep <laughs> and and just a different diagnostic because again maybe to remind you know in our last episode we ended off talking about vaccines but we talked about the swiss cheese right way of thinking about things where it's like yes vaccines but there's still all the other interventions that we have that are going to be really important and i think diagnostics are going to be really important and remain very important things um i would like to see some basic buzzword guess crispr cast stuff uh how it, that intersects the diagnostic space plus it seemed like a good paper yeah uh, and it can fit in your pocket so everyone has a mobile phone we can all do a covid test paper yeah absolutely absolutely uh, um don't reference me on that don't don't quote me on that <laughs> <laughs> i do not want to be quoted on that but yeah so that's why we're going to be trying to look at we're going to be looking at amplification free detection of sars cov2 with crispr cast 13a and microphone sorry and mobile phone microscopy. microscopy. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. Yeah. We uh, we want to remind everyone that while we're very enthusiastic about microbiology and somewhat qualified, it's possible that we didn't get everything right. Uh, science about thinking critically and asking the right questions. So if you have any questions or corrections, please let us know in the comments. <clears throat> Yeah, and uh, so also you can reach out to us over over Twitter with the hashtag uh, MicroTWJC. We both believe that peer review is a process which you can all participate in, and I hope you've all had a good time listening to us ramble on about microbiology today. And if you think you have something to add or found something unclear, please let us know. Uh, yeah, it's uh, been a pleasure chatting with you, Fuzz. <laughs> uh, and with you, Danny. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, tune in next week for more microbiology content. Thank <laughs> you.